Amen. Welcome to Grace. Have a seat. I'm Pastor Brooks. I'll be bringing you the Word this morning as we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at uh, the 17th chapter of John, and this is one long prayer. Uh, if you if you, uh, if you look at the very last couple verses of chapter 16, where Pastor Paul covered last week, he says in verse 33, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We're going to take a look at, at a prayer this morning where the entire focus is Jesus not speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to the Pharisees. He's not speaking to a crowd. He's not speaking to the woman at the well. He's not speaking to Nicodemus. He's speaking exclusively to his father. And the disciples are listening in as he prays, and we will be listening in as he prays. You can learn a lot about a person from how they pray. More importantly, we can learn a lot about what we need in life as we listen to Jesus pray. Think about your own prayer life just for a second. Um, I would say most people who would consider themselves Christians, and probably most people who don't consider themselves Christians, if you said, do you believe in prayer? They'd probably say yes. And you ask them, well, how is your prayer life? And most people would say, well, it's lacking. It's lacking. Now, think about the types of things that you do pray for. What typically motivates a person to pray? Typically, what motivates a person to pray is that there's something they don't have that they think they need to attain happiness or joy. Now, that, that, don't think that that's necessarily shallow. It might not be shallow. Uh, it might be shallow that you think, well, I need a, uh, a Ferrari to be happy, and so you ask God for that. I think that's pretty shallow. Or I need my favorite team this afternoon to win. That's fairly shallow. But there are other things which are not at all shallow. Lord, I need you to develop patience in me so I can have joy. There's nothing shallow about asking God to give you something you lack if what you lack truly will help you become more Christ-like. Or sometimes we pray for God to remove things which we do have, which we think prevents us from receiving joy. It could be a bad relationship. It could be poor health. It could be, uh, it could be any number of circumstances. You're praying that God change this, remove this. Paul did it in 2 Corinthians. He said, Lord, remove this thorn from my flesh. Prayed that three different times. So our prayers, by and large, we pray whether we're asking God for something or that we're asking God to remove something from us, we do so because we want joy. And there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting joy. Okay? In fact, John chapter 15 Verse 11, Jesus says, in verse 11, he says, These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So it, does, does God have a problem with you seeking and desiring joy? What do you think? I'm going to go with a no since that's his stated objective. Okay? That's okay. That's okay. But where is the source of that joy? When we pray, we ask for things that we think will bring us joy. When Jesus prays, he prays for things that he knows will bring joy. And so what we're going to look at over the next three weeks is, first of all, Jesus' prayer for himself, and then next week we'll look at Jesus' prayer for his disciples, and then after that, three weeks, we will look at his prayer for those who will believe in his name after disciples are long and gone, and that would be us. Characterized in John chapter 17, verse 13, he says, Now I'm coming to you, speaking to the Father, and these things I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. That's Jesus' objective, is that we would be uh, filled with his joy. So I'm going to read just the scripture we're going to cover this morning, and then we will go to the Lord together and seek that the Holy Spirit would guide us into truth. So read along with me, and starting in verse 1. Chapter 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hours come, glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Heavenly Father, as we look at Jesus' words to you, as he prayed to you, we pray to you right now. And we ask, Father, that you would accomplish what he prayed, that you would bring glory to the Son and that you'd bring glory to yourself. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to understand the text, that you would make it come alive to us, that you would reveal things which hinder us from understanding. Lord, we recognize that uh, you desired for us to worship in spirit and in truth, so Spirit, reveal the truth to us. Father, reveal where there are um, things in our hearts which prevent us from drawing near to you. Lord, we just ask that Christ would be exalted this morning. Help me to preach and to teach in his power in such a way that his prayer is actually answered this morning, that he would be honored, and in so being honored, you, Father, would be honored as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at the text. When Jesus had spoken these words, that's a reference to chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. Recall that those four chapters, that's one long discourse. It's the upper room. It's the Last Supper. So the last four chapters in the Gospel of John have been a dinner exchange. That's, that's what you've been reading. So there's Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and he says, if I have loved you, I want you to love one another. Then he tells them, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, but you know the way, and then you'll follow. And then Thomas says, how can we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I am leaving but I'm not going to leave you as orphans because I'm going to send another one who is like me. He will be in you because he's with you and he will guide you into all truth. And he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth. He's going to bring to remembrance the things that I've taught you. He's going to convict the world in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment. And he says, and don't think the world is going to applaud you because you love me and follow me. They hated me, they're going to hate you too. They think, the world thinks, that they will be doing my father a service by casting you out of the synagogue. And then as Pastor Paul preached last week, he says, take heart, there will be trouble, there will be tribulation in this world, but take heart because I've overcome the world. So when Jesus had spoken these words, that's a synopsis of the last four chapters, then he stopped speaking to his disciples and he gazes heavenward, and he begins to speak to his Father, and he prays. This is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the entire Bible. It's the whole 17th chapter is Jesus speaking to his Father, expressing the desires of his heart, expressing the desires of his heart. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, everything you hear from this point forward is what Jesus is asking his dad to do. Okay, so this is the essence of his prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that he may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. In the first five verses alone, in the first five verses alone, Jesus uses the word glory. The Greek word is dexoxo. It, it, he uses it five different times. In those five verses, I'm sorry, seven different times. In five verses, he uses the word seven different times. What he wants, it's not a trick question. Father, the hour has come. What's he asking for? Verse one, what does he want? Father, I want you to glorify your son. Glorify your son. Now, how many of you at first glance thinks, well, that's rather petty, petty and selfish. I mean, if you've prayed, Father, this morning, I just, I just, want, I just want to be glorified. How, how many of you would think that would be a somewhat selfish prayer? Okay, it's really scary that no one raised their hand. Absolutely terrifying. I'm just going to go with you know that that's, that's kind of a selfish prayer. But notice that this is not a selfish prayer because Jesus knows that in being glorified, it's, it's, it, it brings about something else. So that, I want you to glorify me, so that, this, that you're glorified. Okay, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. If 
Jesus is glorified, the Father is glorified. If Jesus is not glorified, the Father's not glorified. This is how this works. Now, if I'm glorified, Jesus is not glorified. So this is altogether different. Jesus is not simply a dude praying for his own exaltation. Okay, we're going to, we're going to learn that. We're going to learn that as we go here. Jesus is asking for glory. Now, the word glory, what's it mean? It means uh, praise. It means to honor. It means to extol. It means to clothe in splendor. It means to re- enhance the reputation of. If you were here way back when we were in uh, John chapter uh, 12, we looked at this word glory because Jesus uses it there too. And we looked at that. And the word, if you go back into the Hebrew in the, in the Old Testament, they, the, the word, it, it, meant to, it meant to have weight. So if something was glorious, it was heavy. It was weighty. It mattered. Matter is the stuff of, of stuff, substance. If, there's, if something has matter, it has, it has mass. And so if something, something matters, it's, it's weighty, it's glorious. So the question is, here's what Jesus is saying. Lord, make me matter. I want to matter to the world. I want you to matter to the world. And I, and I, want, I, want, I want us to matter. I want us to be glorified. I want us to be glorified. Now, if he's asking that question, if he's asking for this, if this is a request, what does that imply about whether or not he's being glorified at the moment? Let me ask you this. How many of you have really, really, really good health? Just a quick show of hands. I know there's Pharaoh's people here, so you kind of have to raise your hands, right? So you have really, really good health. So when you have really, really good health, do you say, Lord Jesus Give me good health. If you have it already? No, you don't. Who are the people that ask for health when they pray for health? They're people that don't have it. We typically do not ask for the things we already possess. Now, we thank God for our health if we're healthy, but we don't ask him for our health if we're healthy. Does that make sense? Jesus wouldn't be asking for glory if he had it already. Follow me? Jump ahead to verse 5. It won't be on the PowerPoint, but if you just scroll your eyeballs down, if you have a Bible. uh, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had, I had with you before the world existence. So here's what Jesus is saying. I don't have the glory that I had when I was with you before the world existed. That glory is, it's departed. And consequently, because I don't have that glory, you are not receiving that glory either. So I'm asking for that which I possess at one time, and I want it restored, and I want it restored. So let's take a look at, let's go back to that beginning real quick. The beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning, speaking about at the time of creation, before anything existed except God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, those of you that have been following this series out for a while, who is the Word referring to? Okay, God, evidently, but God who? God the Son. He's referring to Jesus. And we know that from John chapter four or chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in the beginning was the Word, okay? So the Son, Jesus, was there in the beginning. And the Word was with God. So Jesus was with the Father. Okay, that is, they were, they were to, there together. But then it gets weirder. And Jesus was God. So he's with God and is God. He said, well, how can you be both at the same time? Yeah, it's a good question. It's called the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was in the beginning with God. And, and look at verse 3. All things were made through him. All things were made through him. And without him not, was not anything made that has been made. Okay, we'll just pause right there for a second. Glory was something that Christ had with the Father before creation. That's what he says in John chapter 17, verse 5. Restore to me the glory that I had when I was with you before the foundations of the world. So he had it before. He had it there, right there, in the beginning. He had it. He had it. Now, what is glory? What is glory? 
It's praise, it's honor, it's exaltation, it's to close something with splendor. It, it, it means to be weighty, to be substantive. So within this relationship, the Word was God and the Word was with God, there is perfect unity. There's perfect unity. Now, I want you to think in terms of your relationships. Okay, there's a relationship here, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a relationship here. Now, in terms of your relationship. Um, those of you that are married can certainly relate to this. Those of you who have relationships with close friends, you can relate to this. So unless you're a hermit and you live under a rock, this should be an application that works for you. What's a criteria for joy in a relationship? This should be easy. For some of you, you don't have a good relationship. Your marriage is teetering. Your marriage is painful. So you ought to be able to say, well, I don't have it, but if I had this, then, then there'd be joy. Here's what's required for a relationship to have joy. Glory. Glory. The kind of glory that you see here between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me explain. Let me explain. In a perfect relationship, the other person, I'm happy when my spouse is happy. So what makes a spouse the happiest? When their spouse is the happiest. There's a deferment of glory. No, you first. No, really, you first. No, you. After all, no, you first. There's a deferment. There's constantly seeking to affirm and honor the other. When you have a marriage or a relationship with a friend like that, you're humming. When you don't, you know it. If you're in a relationship right now where the other person is seeking their glory and they're not seeking your honor, it's painful because they're selfish, right? That doesn't happen in eternity past with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You get a glimpse of that the way that Jesus operates. He's constantly doing everything to bring glory to his Father. And the Father's bringing glory to Him, and the Son's bringing glory to the Son, and, or the Spirit's bringing glory to the Son, and so forth and so on. That's the Trinity. That's the Trinity. Constantly communicating, constantly honoring, constantly loving. In Genesis chapter 1, it says that we were created, man was created in the image of God. Well, in John chapter, or 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says that God is love. So God is loving by definition. So therefore, man in his nature has the capacity to love. And within the Godhead, before a molecule was created, there was love, there was honor, there was praise, there was glory, there was deferment, there was selflessness. You, you see that? You see that? So that's in the beginning. And then, look at verse 3, all things were made through him. All things were made through him. So all of this came into existence. Why? Because he wanted it to. For what purpose? Some people mistakenly think that, well, God created man in his image because he, he was lonely and he just didn't have anyone there in, in the nothingness of the universe without us. And so he wanted to make us so he could have someone to talk to. That's not true. God was never lonely. He was infinitely happy. I love how Tim Keller puts it. Tim Keller said it this way. He says, God did not create the world to get happy. He was already infinitely happy. He didn't create the world to get love. He was already infinitely filled with love. He created the world to share it, to share it, so that we as human beings would give Him glory, praise and honor Him, give one another glory, praise and honor one another, and that we would experience that love between Him and one another. So it's, it's not to, to bring about something that didn't exist, but to share it, to share it. And that's how it was in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God said everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But that's not the way it is now, is it? When I described the Trinity, I didn't describe most of your relationships, humanly speaking. I didn't. When I describe the opposite of that, you said, well, that actually looks like most of my relationships, or at least some of them. That's the reality. That's the reality. And consequently, people lack joy, lack joy. Here's why. Romans chapter 1, 
verse 21 and 23, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. For although they being humanity, that's all of us, although they knew God, in an intellectual sense, we all know that there is a God, um, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. That word honor, the Greek word is, is, uh, is doxazo. It's the exact word that's translated glory eight different times in the 17th chapter of John. So the word can be translated from, from the Greek into the English. It can mean glory. It can also mean honor. They're, they're synonymous. So although they knew God, they did not give glory to God or they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But but they became futile in their thinking. In other words, their thinking uh, it doesn't mean stupid. It means the end of their logic came to a dead end. That they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts, their hearts were darkened. That's the seat of their desires. When, when you see the Bible talk about heart, it's the seat of desire. Okay? Their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why? Why were their foolish hearts darkened? Look at verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That does not mean stupid. That does not mean uh, their IQ dropped. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, this is the linchpin. And they exchanged the what? What they exchange? The glory of God, the glory of the immortal God for images resembling birds, reptiles, so forth and so on and so forth. Now, here's what, here's what he's saying. Glory means that which has substance. That what ma- that's what matters. In other words, they exchanged that which really mattered in life for that which doesn't matter at all. So what matters is God's glory. He created it for us to have a relationship with himself and a relationship with one another to praise and extol and honor and clothe him with splendor, to find our joy in our relationship with him And that's what matters. And we said, that doesn't matter. What matters is food. What matters is sex. What matters is money. What matters is my praise. What matters is my honor. What matters is the whole world revolves around me. Notice. When he exchanged, we exchanged the glory of God for immortal images resembling birds, reptiles, so forth and so on. That's another word for, for idols. We exchange the glory, that which matters, for something that doesn't matter. That does not mean those things are inherently wicked or sinful. Everything that I mentioned, sex, created by God, it's good. Food, created by God, food is good. Work, work is good. Money, is good. All of these things are neutral or gifts by God that are given to us, but when we take those things and we give them glory, in other words, we ascribe to them ultimate worth and ultimate matter, then everything starts to break down. And here's the irony. We think that if we have those things, then we will have true joy. Then we will have true joy. And Jesus is like, Father, the world is so jacked up, so messed up. The world finds glory and honor in things which don't deliver. So, Lord, I'm asking, Father, I'm asking that you glorify me so that I glorify you so that their joy would be complete. Our joy, here's the the irony. This is so ironic. Our joy is contingent upon us finding glory in him and not the things that we look for for joy. Does that make sense? Four or five of you nodded, so good tracking with about one percent of you excellent all right let's let's keep going here let's keep going here why can't we see it why are we not able to hear it or see it why can't we see that which matters and actually think that it matters paul puts it this way in second corinthians chapter four he says in their case in, in verse three he had just stated regarding those who do not believe Okay, so those who do not believe the gospel. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So back it up. Look at verse 4 here. In their case, the, what's it say? God. Notice that's a lowercase g. Don't confuse this with the God who created the world has caused them to not be able to see. 
The God of this world never refers to, never refers to Christ, never refers to the Father. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is Satan is what this is referring to, the great deceiver. He's pulled the wool over your eyes, so to speak. He's deceived. He's He's shielded. And and what is it that we can't see? What is it that the world can't see? To keep them from seeing what? The light of what? The light of the gospel. But there's another modifier here. The light of the gospel of what? The gospel of the glory. There it is. The weightiness, the massiveness of the glory of Christ. You know, people, most people don't look at Jesus as the all-consuming central thing in the universe. They look at him as an old dude with a beard who wore a robe and hung around shepherds and taught people how to eat good. There's nothing massive or glorious about a bathrobe Jesus. There isn't. And that's typically what people think of when they think of Jesus. He's a felt cutout on a Sunday school board. That's not who Paul sees Christ as. That's not who he is. I'm not saying that he didn't wear a robe and he didn't hang around shepherds. That's not the point. But he's so much more than that. And the enemy blinds the minds of unbelievers to shield them, to blind them so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory. There's that word, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Who is the image of God. Okay, back to his prayer. Father, the hour has come. The time is now. The time is now. Everything in history up until this point was building up to this moment. To this moment. The hour is now. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, transition into how that's going to happen. So that's his prayer. Jesus also know the means by which his own prayer is going to be accomplished. In verse 2, he says, since you've given him authority over all flesh. Who is him, by the way? He's referring to himself. Generally, when I pray, I don't pray that way. But Jesus can speak of himself in whatever way he chooses because he's Jesus after all. So he says, since you have given him, in other words, me, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Notice the connection between his glorification, his father's glorification, and and those who do not know Jesus being brought into eternal life. There's a connection there. He says, and this, now he defines it. He defines eternal life. Oh, before I do this, I don't want you looking. Just a, a quick test. If, if you had a blank piece of paper, and you don't, well, some of you might have notes. If you had a blank piece of paper, and I asked you to define salvation, define salvation, how would you define it? How would you define eternal life? I would tell you that probably when I first became a Christian, for many, many years, I would have defined eternal life this way. Eternal life is the fact that Jesus Christ has given himself on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. He has gifted me his righteousness. I am pardoned, I am forgiven, and I have been made an adopted child of God. And therefore, I go to heaven when I die. I would have said that. Now, is that true? All of those things are true, and that's part of the gospel. But how does Jesus define eternal life? And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. How does Jesus define eternal life? That's the key to your joy. That's the key to my joy. That's the key for you to see him as glorious. That's the key for me to see him as glorious and thereby see the Father as glorious. How do you, what is eternal life? It's you actually knowing him intimately, knowing God. This is eternal life, that they know you. There's a sense of intimacy there. Go back to the the perfect relationship. The perfect relationship is when a spouse seeks to see their spouse happy. I'm happy when my wife's happy. Happy wife, happy life, right? My greatest desire is to see my wife happy. My greatest desire is to see others happy. The father's greatest desire is to see the son happy have joy. The son's greatest desire is to see the father have joy. To do that, you have to know a person, right? 
How many of you have marriages or relationships where you feel frustrated because you're like, my spouse doesn't even know me? I don't even know my spouse. That's the definition of eternal life when you're looking at God. I know God. I think his thoughts after him. I know what makes his heart beat. I know what grieves him. I know what makes him happy. To know God and have an intimate, personal relationship with him. To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I've glorified you on earth, Jesus says, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. John 6, verse 38, Jesus says, I came not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is his will, that I might give eternal life to those whom he has given to me. That's his will. That's what he wants. He wants you and I to come into a face-to-face relationship with him and for him to be the most important central thing in our lives. He wants us to find our joy in knowing him because that's what eternal life is. And look at verse 5. And now, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And now. There it is. So he says, restore to me the glory that I had, I had with you before the world existed. We kind of covered that already. So Jesus had this glory. He wants it back. He wants to receive that glory again. And in receiving that glory, he knows the Father will be glorified. And as the Father is glorified, he knows that all those whom the Father has given to him will will see that glory that they're currently blinded to, that they can't see. They can't see the weightiness of who Jesus is. But after this prayer, and now, Father, glorify yourself. And then they'll be able to see your glory. They'll be able to see my glory. What's he referring to? There's a means by which he becomes glorious. And it's the most ironic thing in the history of irony. I don't think there could be a more ironic twist into what happens after verse 5 in terms of, in terms of how, how, this, how this comes about. Okay, first of all, let's take a look at the fact that Jesus at one time had this glory, but then he didn't have this glory. So how did he, what happened? happened. Philippians 2.5 sheds some light on this. Paul says to us, followers of Christ, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. In other words, have the mind of Christ. Okay, this is the mind of Christ. And he goes back, he says, who, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God something to grasp. Okay, so pause for a second. He's saying, in eternity past, before the creation of the world, The Father was receiving glory from the Son, and the Son was uh, giving glory to the Father. And the Holy Spirit was in on this too. So he, he, he in every way is equal with God. And he was glorified, and he was glorious. But he didn't consider equality with God something he grasped. But what does verse 7 say? But he what? He emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So God, God the Son, who existed in eternity past, always glorified in the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit, constantly loving, constantly being loved, constantly honoring, constantly receiving honor. He becomes flesh and becomes a baby in a manger in a a, a pig pen. Well, they're Jews, no pigs. Okay, In in a stable. Okay, the incarnation. There's nothing glorious about his birth. There's nothing glorious about him the way he was raised. Raised in relative obscurity, in poverty to a Jewish teenage, uh, teenage mom and, a, and an older carpenter dad. There's nothing glorious there. There's nothing glorious. And then he goes public in his ministry. And he doesn't exalt himself as a king the way the world would exalt him as king. He says, I didn't come to to, to be served. I came to serve and give my life as a ransom. And that's why the second part of of, of verse 8 here in Philippians 2, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Prophetically, Isaiah the prophet, hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was born, spoke this about the coming Messiah. In chapter 52, verse 2, 
talks about the Messiah, this, this one who would become flesh and dwell among us, this, this one who is God in every way, but humbled himself and emptied himself. Here's what he says, for you shall not go in haste and you shall not go out and fight for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Verse 13, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Verse 14, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. Here's what he's saying. The Savior will come, God will come in human flesh, and he will be so beaten, and he will be so bloodied, and he will be so pummeled that when you look at him, you will not barely recognize him as a human being. And then in chapter 53, Isaiah, in the next chapter, verse 2 and 3, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. When Jesus became man, when he put on human flesh, there was nothing intrinsically awesome about him that you would say, wow, there's someone who deserves my glory. He's the son of a carpenter. That's it. That's it. So in being found as human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here's the irony. The irony is this. The shame of the cross is the only way that Christ can receive glory. I mean, think about that. that if, you want to, if you want someone to receive glory... It doesn't compute that, oh, here's the path, nail them to a cross. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Now is the time. Give me the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. Now, what is now referred to, the hour has come for my death, for my burial, for my resurrection. This is the irony of the cross. The only way that Christ is seen as glorious is to receive the ignominy and the shame of the cross. The only way that God is exalted is for God to become flesh and take on the sin of the world. The only way that Christ is exalted is to take on Brooks' sin and to suffer for that. The only way that Christ is exalted is for the Father to turn his face away from him and, and not honor him but to utterly forsake him. And that's why you hear on the cross Jesus say these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if the father responded, it would see, he would say this, so that you ultimately could be lifted up, so that you ultimately could be exalted because without the ignominy of the cross, without the shame of the cross, without the violence of the cross, the world will never, ever see me as loving and they'll never see you as who you are. But through the cross, Christ is lifted up and exalted. And that's why Paul says, therefore, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. Has your knee bowed? Has your tongue confessed? Or is his glory still shielded to you and you just, I just, I don't know what you're, I don't understand. I can tell you that the reason Jesus is praying this prayer, and we'll get to this in a couple weeks, is because he knows that people don't see it. He's praying that you would see it. He's praying that you would see the cross and it would blow your mind. He's praying that you would see the cross and your heart, which is stone, would melt
He's praying that the Holy Spirit do what he said the Holy Spirit was going to do in John 16, where he said the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Do you know what he's praying? He's praying that when the cross is preached, that you would feel that, that you would see the ignominy and the shame of Jesus on the cross, and that you would recognize that, oh, that's because of I have exchanged his glory for something else. But, but don't despair. Don't despair because he doesn't leave you there. He says, but I love you. That's why I'm on the cross. That's why I went to the cross. That's why I was buried. And that's why I conquered sin and death. So that there would be no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The only question that remind, remains is, are you in Christ? Has your knee bowed? Has your tongue confessed? It's a lot to swallow on one Sunday, Brooks. I just got here. I get that. I first walked into this church and in January of 1988. It didn't all come together for me the first time I heard the gospel. But I kept coming and I kept, I kept reading the Bible. And then you know what the Holy Spirit did with his word, which he inspired? He kept pointing me back to the cross. Brooks, look at the cross. Brooks, look at the cross. Brooks, look at the cross. Now look at the tomb. Who's in the tomb? No one. Exactly. It's empty. I've conquered sin. I've conquered death. I've conquered your sin. And I'm giving you the gift of eternal life. Would you, would you just take it? John says in John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right, the right to become children of God. You were not born a child of God. You were born and you're dead in your transgressions and sins. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. That's true for all of us. But he says in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, but being rich in mercy, he has made us alive in Christ by grace through faith. Yet to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. All you have to do is acknowledge your need of him. You don't have to understand systematic theology that comes later. Is Christ glorious to you? I have to be truthful. It starts by receiving him as Savior, and that's what he's referring to here. But it also continues as, as we, as followers of Christ, have been following Jesus since 1988, and I cannot tell you that there is a week that goes by when I don't subconsciously exchange his glory for something which is far less. Anytime I lift up as something more valuable than Christ... I guarantee you it will derail my relationships horizontally with other people. Always. There are no exceptions. That's why John says in 1 John chapter 1, if we have fellowship with God and walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You want to know why your relationships don't work? It's because oftentimes you, like me, ascribe glory to something that isn't glorious. I need my wife to respect me. If I can't have that, I can't have happiness. Well, there's a recipe for a crappy marriage right there. Okay, I could give you thousands of other examples, and they would all have the same end. Without Christ being the most glorious thing in your life, there's no joy. Hence, Jesus' prayer. Lord, Father, make me glorious. Restore to me the glory that I had before the foundation of the world so that I could give you glory. And the only way to do that is by me going to the cross. I want these people to see me as valuable. I want them to see you as loving. And when they find their ultimate joy in me, they'll have ultimate joy. And they won't until that point. People, this is not an event, but it starts with an event. And that's your spiritual birth. That's stepping onto the field and saying, I'm in. I'm in. Every day until then is you spectating. We're called to run the race marked out before us, not watch other people run it. So Christ is inviting you to run the race. He's inviting you to receive his grace. He's inviting you to allow his glory to transform you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the fact that whether or not we see it or not, you are worthy of all of our praise, all of our honor, and you are ultimately glorious. 
Lord, there are many here that uh, this sermon is, and the context is, is a bit much in the sense that I uh, haven't even thought of this before. I pray, Father, Holy Spirit, that you would draw them to yourself. Father, I pray that you would convict people of sin and also convict them that you are the provision of that sin, that you love them so much that you gave yourself for them. I pray that there might be some here this morning who would cry out to you and just simply pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, save me. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Thank you that you have glorified him by raising him from the dead to conquer sin and death. And Lord, for those of us who are following you and um, we received you maybe just recently or some years ago, Lord, help us to never lose sight of the fact that you are truly the glorious one. Lord, help us to live for your glory, for your honor, and that all things Christ might be exalted and lifted up. It's in his name we pray, amen. God bless, go in grace. We'll see you next week.